Okay, right, in this video, we're going to do another big bowl, but this one is different. This, I'm going to rough this out. This is a wet blank. Right, it's a uh, Spanish chestnut, and it just about fits on the light. You see there, I had to take it down with a power plane, and there, so it would actually spin. Right, uh weight is the issue with these right there's an effect called a flywheel effect and i'll show you it in a bit right which makes tourney blanks like this kind of dodgy right i could have done a better job with the chainsaw just there i just missed right now i was a very good boy this year and sadly brought me a present right it's uh Thompson ball gouge right now the thing about ball about gouges right in America they measure differently to what we do here in Europe right in America this is a 5 8 ball gouge in Europe it's a half inch the reason being is in Europe we measure the width of the flute in America, they measure the width of the whole bar. Now, that works both ways. I actually had a conversation with a toner in America who wanted a certain brand of gouge that wasn't available in America. So he was going to import it from Europe. And he spent ages looking for a 5.8 ball gouge. Couldn't get one. And eventually ordered uh, a 5.8 not the brand he wanted, but he ordered it from America. He had been looking at them, but what he didn't realize was the different way that we measure. Right? He'd been looking at half inch ball gouges, but he wanted a 5.8. And uh, didn't realize he'd actually been looking at what he was looking for. But it's just something to remember. If you're ordering a gouge from the States and you say want a half inch, you're looking at a 5.8, not half inch. And the same the other way around, right? Now, I haven't used this yet. This is the first time. So what I'm going to do is I will put my own grind on this. Because I like uh, a long Irish grind. Right? And Doug puts uh, that grind on it, which I believe is 60 degrees. My own grind is somewhere around 60 degrees as well. I honestly could not tell you what it is but it's the one I prefer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my own grind on this and then we'll start with the tourney. And what I'll do uh, is I'll, put, I'll take a screenshot here and then I'll take a screenshot in the same place after I put the grind on it to show you what the difference is. This. So I'll be back when I do that. And there's my preferred grind. Which, as I said, it's a it's a long early screen. When you buy, when when you get yourself a new gouge, uh, don't think you have to stay with the grind that comes with it. You can change it into your preferred grind. Now, as I said, this thing is big and it's heavy. Right. Now, there's something I want to show you before I start this. Right. To do it, I'm going to take the tail stock away, just for a minute. Right, the flywheel effect that I mentioned earlier on. Now, I have cranked this down. I've held in the stop and I've cranked it down as hard as I can. Right? The flywheel effect is caused basically by whatever you're turning, the size of it and the weight of it, overriding the stopping speed on your lathe. Right? Uh, the simplest way to explain this is I'm going to show it to you. Right? Start the lathe and bring it up to, say, something low, 120. It's, there you go, 121, right? And I'm just going to stop the lathe the way I normally would, if I, the way you normally would if you were turning a normal bowl. See the way it's hitting now? What's happened is this is now loose. Right? See, I can turn it back. 
the weight of this acted like a flywheel and actually unscrewed it. Now, your tailstock will not stop this. Right? If you accidentally are turning it, say, 200, 250, and you hit your stop button, the flywheel effect will actually push your tailstock. Right? I've done it. Right? The way to counteract it is... Right, I'll lock that down again. Right. Right, there's two ways of counteracting it. Either have a faceplate that has grub screws in it, and even then, it may not. The other way, right, is, right, I'll bring that up to same speed again, right, well, close enough, right. Don't just turn your lathe off, slow it down. And then it won't unscrew because you're slowing the inertia down. Right? It's just something to watch for if you're doing really big, heavy stuff. Right? Now I'll put the tail stack back. Right. And I'll make sure everything is locked down very tight. Now I've got the laid bed because this of what this wood is, it's very high in tannin. So I have everything basically covered in paste wax. It's still gonna go black, but it'll help a bit. Right, here we go. First time using this Thompson. Uh, what I'll do is as I'm going, I'll tell you what I think of it as I'm going. Right. Right. Number one, it's a lot longer than my old one. That's my crown that I've used for a long time. Right. Okay, as you see, it's ground well down, but the handle length is a lot longer, and it's a lot heavier, which should make it more stable. Right, first thing I'm going to do, as I did with the last bowl, is balance. I'm going to round it off, and then I'm going to flatten off there. Right, so let's get going on this. Let's see what we can get out of it without vibration. I can get to 300. Right, now let's try this Thompson and see what the story is with it. It feels very different. It's a lot longer. I'm actually choked up on the handle to there. And this bit is on my hip. I suppose it's... I can't even feel that. Stability on the gouge is excellent. I can't even feel it. Now I'm gonna put on my heavy duty mask for this, which I honestly should have done before I started, but I never thought of it. Right. So I will probably sound really funny because this heavy duty mask is actually a full helmet. Right, I have a heavy duty mask on. I think something's uncomfortable in there. What's that? Okay. Right. Right, I have a heavy duty mask on. I do not know what I sound like.
Let's have a look at this. Still need to cut there, 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 there. Okay, what's that? That's for that will come out. Oh, there's a nice piece of figure just there. Put that trousers out on the inside. Same figure is just there. Right, the pith is still in this, so I'm gonna have to cut down past that pith. See, I got these and um, they were already chainsawed into half for me. The guy got them up really nice fella. Now where did I put that in this place? Right, we get the speeding back up again now. Up to 230 now. We're back at it. We're still very solid at basically 400. Right, have a look and see how we're doing. Flat just there. Otherwise, we seem to be good. Okay, let's get this back up to speed again. Get rid of the flat. Yeah, we can start poking some shape into this a little bit. And I'll force the really to flatten that off, shouldn't I? I'll take that little ridge out of it. Check for clearance. Always check for clearance if you're doing something big. I'm going to always check for clearance anyway. Right. Yeah, there's a little ridge just there I'm going to get rid of. Stuck up as long as I can. Not clear. Use your 
everything's locked down. Let's have a bit of extra light so we can see what I'm doing. Right. Right, here we go. away for lunch so uh, right what I want to do now is I want to mark the tenon here uh, before I start shaping the ball so that uh, it gives me a guide now when you're doing a tenon on one of these and it's wet make it oversized because you will need to sh make it smaller when it goes oval and it will go oval right uh, I was asked a question about preferences for mortises and tenons and stuff. Right, a tenon on a wet bowl is easier to reshape than a mortise. Um, I would use a mortise on a dry bowl, depending on the shape I wanted base to be if I want a foot on it that's kind of fancy I'll use a mortise because then what you can do basically is you will have a sh let's say that that's the bottom of the mortise you can have it come out like that up up and then go and you'll have a fancy mortise uh, I would never use a mortise on an end grain bowl it's uh, you're forcing the fibers apart at their weakest point that way you put you need to use crush on that um, but on wet balls I always use tenons because as I said basically they're just easier to reshape than a mortise is right. I'll go further into that in a different video okay now the first thing I need to do is give myself a mark for this now this is oversized right that's the size I'm using. All right, those jaws should be closer. All right, but I'm using that to give myself room to uh, to make it to make the reshaped tenon. There is the size I need. Now, first thing I'm going to do is define that. Right, define that using a parting tool. Give myself a guide. And then when I get rid of the tailstock, I will finish shaping that. Now we'll start shaping this thing. See what I can get out of it. Here, five. Okay. Right, we'll start shaping this. Uh, the new gouge seems to be working fine, actually. Uh, they said it's very stable compared to the old one, possibly because of the went the weight or the length. So I'm just gonna I'll probably speed the video up here just because uh, all I'm gonna be doing is putting a shape on this a very rough shape I can hear something hitting there I'm just wondering what it is it could be one of those uh, 
branches that's going to give the nice effect inside. I don't know if I got to put my brace on and I can feel it. Just there. Yeah, it is one of the branches. Yeah, let's put my brace on. Just there, maybe, or there I'm hitting, but I can feel it. Right, let's turn the tail a little. Give myself a better angle, and I'm clear. See what we can get out of this without any 550. Okay, without any uh, vibration whatsoever. Let's try a pole coat with this. That looks really nice on a poco. There's no pressure at all on the pole cut, which is pole cut is very good for um, just hogging away wood. Thought so. I'm slightly high with that gouge. So the sweet spot on the tool rest using the uh, Thompson gouge is slightly lower than it is with the crown. I just want to see how close I am to that chainsaw cut. Just starting on it. Well, there's a bit to go on that yet. You know. Right, I'm going to give this another sharpen. I don't think it's quite dialed in just yet. There is that. Yeah, we're getting there. These are the old backwards cut on us. This is not a finished cut, I'm not too pushed, I'm cutting the wrong way. So we'll look at how much of that we got rid of that with that one. Right, that last cut was actually the wrong way for this orientation of bowl. But it's not a finished cut. 
so I'm not too pushed about it. And the offending chainsaw mark is gone. Now that that's gone, we can actually start shaping this properly. Right, have my tenon mark there. So okay. All right, now we'll start shaping this properly. We got a six hundred. We got red. Yeah, this is just a rough turning, but I'm still thinking of what it's going to look like when it's done. And I'm also thinking about this bowl is not actually going to be the full height of this blank. I have to take off probably down to about there because of the pith. Right. Yeah, I might actually mark that just to give myself a reference point for shaping. Right. There's the top pith and there's the low pith. Right there. So it has to come, yeah, I'm nearly right. It has to come down to about there. I'll give myself a mark there just so that I know where I'm going to be cutting to. So that's going to be about the height, the proper height of this bone. So that's where I need to shape to, which means I just need to take out, see the way that it kicks out there a little bit, I need to take that out. Something on that for a rough shape, and that is a very rough shape. Okay. Now, you get rid of the tail stock and sort out that tenon. Make sure that this is flat. When you're doing something this big, precision is highly important. Sorry if that's whiting everything out, but I need to make sure that this is perfect.
see that blade. Yeah, that looks like it to me. Now just take that little nub off. And we should be good. Right. Even with the pace wax, this light has become really sticky. Right, we'll take this off. Right, and yeah, we'll flip her over, cut it down so that the uh, pith is gone, and then hollow the inside out before going in the kiln. Right. right, I'll be back as soon as I see this. It wouldn't rub off like that if I hadn't been covered in paste wax. Uh, so I'll be back when I flip it over. Okay, and we're back. What I've done is I've taken a good two inches off this ball. People are pretty gone. Why did you do that for? Right. It's not worth cutting down on quality just to add size to something. I knew that that bowl was going to crack at that pith. So there's no sense in leaving it there and letting it crack. It will destroy your, stuff like that destroys your reputation. And there's no point in doing it. Let's see if we can actually crank on that. Um, if you know something's going to go wrong with a bowl, get rid of it before it happens. And I knew that was going to crack, so there's no sense in leaving it there. Now, I just left that part there just to show you how much I actually took off. Right? And that's, I threw a reel around it, it's two inches. I dropped the ball by two inches. Now, before I start hollowing, I'm going to get rid of a lot of that. Right. Now, let's see about this. Thompson. Even though there's a lot of weight reduced, I'm still watching for that uh, flywheel effect. Right, seeing as how this is a rough torn ball. We will use the 10% rule, which is 10% of the total width of the bowl. That bowl is now at about 17 inches, so I need 1.7 inches, roughly. It doesn't have to be exact. Right. That's a 1 inch gouge, so 1.7 is about there. Round about. About there. So we'll define it first. Right, and I need to hollow the ball out to that. Okay. Now, let's speed it up now. Let's see what this Thompson is like on hollowing. And I can get up to 700. Right. Let's try this now. Hmm. 
feels quite different on Halloween. Uh, very good on back Halloween. Very stable on back Halloween. But on standard Halloween, it feels very different to control. Very different to control. I suppose like with any new gear, it's just going to take me time to get used to it. It's quite difficult to find the bevel on it. The bevel is there. The level angle is very different from it. Right, I can't go any further in there with the tail stuck in the way, so I'm just going to try and take some weight out of the middle. Right, right now we get rid of that tail stuck and. Uh, See how it goes on Halloween. Then, right then, you're back now. Light. Let's see what I'm doing. Yeah. I'll try and put that light so it doesn't white everything out. Since we're whiting out here a bit, but over here where I'm cutting, it seems to be fine. Okay. Right. Now, where do I put that? There was a, I'll give it a bit of a sharpen and we'll uh, go from there. Right, let's go back to this. And we got a 650. Now, let's see how this works out. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. I'm going to, have to move the camera a little bit further back because the length of the handle is actually going to knock the camera. All right, I hope that's focused properly. Now we keep going. Yes, I'm clear now.
Wow, those hailstones are heavy. There's absolutely hardly any effort at all in cutting with this on the back hollow. Front hall, a little bit different. Let's clear the camera. It definitely does throw shavings, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, just want to check for width. You take a cut in from about right there. Definitely throw shavings. Cuts them. Cuts. Beautifully, actually. Yeah, I think I'm liking this new garage. Just take a little bit of getting used to. Right. Let's check width again. Yeah, that's even. Right, start taking someone in the middle of this out. Check height, yep. Right, have a look at that. Width, we're good. We are good. Take a break for a minute. Right, the battery's about to die on the camera. So I probably will not get this done. Well, I'll put a picture at the end. Uh, if it's any use to you, if you wouldn't mind, subscribe to the channel, and like and share the video. What I wanted to show on this one was basically the flywheel effect and that can be dangerous and uh, what I think of the Thompson gouge it's good it's very good uh, it's going to take me a bit of time to get used to it but uh, I would say that before long it will be my go-to gouge. So, I'll keep following this until the camera runs out. And then I'll finish it and then I'll put up a couple of pictures at the end. So before the camera completely dies, I'll keep going and I'll 
Steve in the next one.